thank you everyone for your patience. Um, sorry about the, the technical uh, stuff. Um, <coughs> and welcome. So this is going to be a course about analytic geometry. Uh, the title is Analytic Stacks, and we're going to be trying to explain the foundations for analytic geometry that we've been uh, trying to set up for the past few years. Um, and in this first lecture, I want to give an introduction, um, or maybe more properly, an introduction to the first half of the course, because um, otherwise I'd be talking about too many concepts in one single lecture. So um, let me set the stage by giving some motivation. So, well, classically, there are actually uh, uh, there are several different theories of analytic geometry. And I'll just list uh, the ones that I'm maybe familiar with. Um, maybe the gold standard is the, the, the usual theory of complex analytic spaces. And in the smooth case, these are the complex manifolds. So they're things you get by gluing together open subsets of C to the N along biholomorphisms. So um, maps that locally admit a, a, a power series expansion. And then there's the non-smooth case as well, where you locally also allow the zero locus of some finite collection of, of analytic functions on those, those open subsets. Um, so that's one thing. There's a generalization of this, which was um, presented in Sarah's book on Lie groups and Lie algebras, which is the lo locally analytic uh, manifolds, or generalization of the smooth case, at least. So here you start with uh, a complete normed field. And it can be Archimedean or non-Archimedean. Um, and then again, you glue uh, open subsets of some k to the d uh, along uh, locally analytic maps or locally analytic isomorphisms. So that means locally around every point, you have a convergent power series expansion with coefficients in the field k. And when k is the complex numbers, it does just recover the smooth case of 1, and that's a nice reasonable theory. Um, when k is the real numbers, it's a sort of a version of the theory of real manifolds, and that's also kind of a, a nice reasonable theory. But when k is non-Archimedean, um, it's, uh, it's not particularly geometrically rich unless you have some extra structure like a group structure or something like this, which uh, gives it more, more geometry. And the reason is, so, uh, so in the non-Archimedean case, so for example, uh, you know, k equals qp, um, there's the, the structure is not rich enough because the topology on QP or QP to the D is totally disconnected. So it's not geometrically rich because the topology is totally disconnected here. Um, so every, you know, every yeah, unit ball will break up into p many other unit balls, and those break up into p many unit balls. And uh, for example, in Sarah's book, you can find a discussion of the classification of compact p-adic manifolds, and it's just a very simple combinatorial classification. And it's the dimension and another invariant, and there's, there's just really not much going on there. Um, so this uh, led then uh, John Tate to uh, well, this and some examples coming from uniformization of elliptic curves led John Tate to uh, introduce the rigid analytic geometry. And this is over a non-Archimedean field. 
So it's a geometrically rich theory, which works also in well, which works in the non-Archimedean case. And in contrast to the theories above, you don't kind of really think of it in terms of uh, specifying some ways of gluing open subsets of k to the d, or you don't even necessarily think about it in topological terms at all. You more actually think about it in algebraic terms. So instead of focusing on a local model, which in the classical case might be something like an a open poly disk, a pro, you know, product of copies of open disks, you instead concentrate on a class of locally allowed functions. So, so there's a turn here. Uh, so focus on local uh, rings of functions instead of local topology. And you kind of let the, the ring of functions tell you sort of what the topology is supposed to be. And the other turn is that the local rings of function, the local models that he uses, uh, are not functions convergent on an open disk, but functions convergent on a closed disk, which is something that makes sense to use in the non-Archimedean context. So the local rings of functions uh, are, well, quotients of. Uh, functions uh, convergent on a closed polydisc. And those are the so-called Tate algebras. Um, and then the, the manner in which you're allowed to glue these local models to get global uh, rigid analytic spaces is slight, it's kind of halfway between algebraic geometry and kind of usual uh, analytic geometry. Yeah, it's not clear if tate algebra is just the, the functions convergent on the, on the polydis or quotients of this. Sometimes they are called affinoid algebras. Oh, OK. If what is, okay. it's a... Uh, it's a pro point about terminology, yeah. yeah. It's not, yeah. sometimes they, in some references they, but I'm not sure if it's a mistake or another, I mean, because I'm not, because it depends on the reference. Right, okay. That's in the two of the references they say this, but the other other one they say affinoid algebra. Okay, let's say it's an affinoid algebra then. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Um, okay, and this was generalized. Uh, whoops, by Huber uh, to the theory of attic spaces. And this is a so this is a generalization. So note that rigid analytic geometry takes place over a base field, and a, a very loose analogy would be that attic spaces are to rigid analytic spaces as general schemes are to varieties over a field. So it's kind of <coughs> yeah some so useful yeah useful generalization where you don't have to have a fixed base field, um, and again uh, you. You focus on, uh, your, you don't think necessarily of your local models topologically. You kind of think of them as being algebraically specified in terms of a ring of functions. But here also there's a new twist. So still have local ring of functions. Uh, by the way, I don't mean local ring in the technical sense from commutative algebra. I mean like ring of functions on a local model, yeah, just, to, just to be clear. Um, Uh, say called A, but you also include uh, extra data of a certain subring, uh, A plus inside A. And um, what this A plus does is, well, to A, you attach some space of valuations uh, and then A plus will sing single out those valuations which view this subring A plus as being consisting of integral elements. Um, so, uh, and it's actually a very nice extra flexibility you have in Huber's theory that you can consider different choices of A plus on a given uh, appropriate topological ring A. Um, and we'll kind of see from a different perspective what, what this choice of A plus is really doing uh, later in this lecture. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I'll go over here.
So when you say local ring of function, yeah. do you mean really a sheaf on that open set? I just, no, I just mean it's something like just you have you specify a certain kind of ring and then you say that's my functions on my basic geometric model, you know, like for you have to have tradition, right? When you go from one open set and you intersect with other open set, yeah. So I I, I, work? I didn't discuss gluing, so that's that you need to say that kind of thing when you discuss gluing. We'll we'll touch on it a little bit later, but I'm actually gonna. For this lecture, I'm mostly going to stick to this sort of affinoid context, where you just look at a single A. But of course, that, that, that does need to be discussed, and it will be discussed. Yeah. Um, then there's um, Berkovich's theory. So, um, so these rings of functions you see both in the rigid analytic context and in the more general attic space context, the, you know, the basic examples are things like you have a ring and it's complete with respect to a finitely generated ideal and you give it the inverse limit topology where all the quotients are discrete. And then maybe you're also allowed to invert uh, something um, provided that the, that inversion is, uh, well, provided that that inversion is kind of inverting everything you completed along, so to speak. Um, so in, for example, in the Tate case, you can write these rings of functions. Uh, so the most basic example of, uh, of these things is you can take uh, like ZP, or let's say Z, just a usual ring of polynomials in one variable, and you can complete it in the p adic topology, and then you can invert P, and that's the functions on the closed unit disk in, the, in A1. Uh, over QP. Um, so you complete along something and then you invert it. And these are also examples of uh, piadic Banach rings. And what Berkovich does is he says, let's just work with arbitrary Banach rings to start with. So here are the local models uh, uh, are given by, uh, by Banach rings. Uh, so that again, um, you're allowing, but now, now again, you're, uh, uh, th while this theory is confined to the non-Archimedean case, this theory over here actually, actually allows Archimedean phenomena as well, because the real numbers and the complex numbers also count as Banach rings. Um, and the, 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 the global theory here is not quite as smoothly functioning as, as here. So to, to this uh, ring, uh, Berkovich attaches this, uh, space of multiplicative semi-norms. So this is just a compact Hausdorff space. And the, the kind of gluing you're allowed to do is in some sense organized by, by this Banach, the, by this uh, Berkovich space. Um, yeah, and I don't necessarily want to get into too much detail about that right now. Um, but uh, for example, you can see the complex analytic spaces as a special case of this, and you can also see rigid analytic geometry in some sense as a as a special case of this. Okay, so this was my very, very brief uh, review of classical theories of analytic geometry, and please feel free to ask questions if you have questions. Um, of course, there are some subtleties of glossed over, like the shiftiness in the Uber theory. And Correct. In the Berkowitz theory, it has this different gluing, like in one, you can glue along opens and get convex manifold, but then yeah. you get to get things like rigid analytics, because it first he has to work only over the field, with finiteness condition, yes, yes. and all things. Yes. And then he does something quite artificial yes. to glue it like you do in rigid geometry, yes. but in his yes. language. In some yes. sense, he just transports yes. it to his language exactly. with, with some extra things which are difficult to remember, some conditions <laughs> under which the theory is equivalent. Yes, exactly, exactly. And then the tau thing in Uber, but the organ is in bed like the tau. Notion allows you to understand the anyway. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, so it, it, the, the relation with rigid analytic geometry is indeed artificial. It's kind of not the correct. Okay, but anyway. Um, so what do I want to say now? I want to explain. Okay, so we have all these theories. That's great. But now, uh, what again was the motivation behind uh, coming up with a new theory? Is it just is it just going to be point six on the list? Well, <laughs> not exactly. So, um, so. Why introduce a new theory? Hmm. 
Well, these are all uh, three or, de or four, or depending on how you count these two, five uh, theories of analytic geometry, and kind of the relationships between them are more or less well known. Like I said, that one is a special case of two, and three. This one is a special case of this one, and it's also a special case of that one. That one's a special case of that. You can formulate comparisons, and the 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 web of these things is kind of well understood, in spite of the, the subtleties sometimes involved in the comparisons. It's, it's fairly well understood. Um, but so far there's no common framework in which you can put all of these examples. They all have their own flavors, and while you can formulate comparisons, it's not that those comparisons are taking place in some larger category that you consider. It's kind of done by hand in, in every situation, formulating the comparisons between these things. So. Uh, want to accommodate all examples. Uh, I never remember how to spell accommodate. Uh, uh, so that's one thing. Um, you'd like a general theory of analytic spaces which can be specialized to whichever context you might uh, be interested in. Um, the second reason would be that, well, so of all these, of all the above, uh, the only rich theory um, allowing both uh, Archimedean and non-Archimedean uh, geometry uh, is Berkovich's. But the gluing uh, uh, is not so well worked out. And in particular, I want to say that it, so the blue gluing was investigated by Berkovich. He, he basically restricted to the non-Archimedean case almost from the start, first of all. Um, and then uh, a more general gluings were investigated by Poineau, for example. Um, but in that, they always, do, they always do the same thing. They fix a Banach ring as the base ring, and then they define affine space of some dimension over that base ring, and then they glue along sub, some kind of subsets of affine space that they, that they pick out. That's sort of how the gluing works in Berkovich's theory. So it's not like, so it's all, ta and then the Banach rings they take as their base rings often have restrictive hypotheses on them. So it's not like you're really understanding how you can glue two Banach rings together to get some more global object. And indeed, the things you're gluing along in these affine spaces are oftentimes not even controlled by Banach rings themselves. They're just some other kind of object. So the nature of the gluing is constrained to a finite type situation, and it's a little artificial. Uh, uh, well, not, not, no, I mean, it's not necessarily artificial, but it doesn't quite fit the mold when you think of how you go from like affine schemes to general schemes, for example, just by gluing those local models in some naive way. Um, and let's, so let me say, and let's say only what you could say finite type. Um, so maybe I go over here. Uh, so another reason is that even individually, in their own context in which they're supposed to operate, uh, these theories are less flexible uh, than, uh, for example, the theory of uh, schemes. And one major reason has to do with issues of descent. Uh, So, for example, one of the main constructions when you have a scheme is the category of quasi-coherent sheaves. Um, and that's a big fancy name, but it's really something simple. When you have a, a ring, commutative ring, you look at the category of modules over that ring. And then it just glues to a general scheme, and that's what a quasi-coherent sheaf is. Um, but you don't have that in analytic geometry in any of the classical theories. And the reason is, okay, I said you always have uh, some local ring, um, 
which is describing the local geometry, so to speak. And of course, to that ring, you can certainly assign the category of all R modules, but then it doesn't glue. So it's just not the case that if you have, you know, in, in any of the allowed gluings that people choose, it's just not the case that an R module on two open subsets or closed subsets or anything uh, that have gluing data on the intersection globalizes to a, a general R module. Hmm? The viewpoint was in analytics already that coherent shapes are the basic tool. Yes, this is the classical person. Yes, and I was going to say this. Um, so you only, only can glue, uh, so maybe finite type or finitely presented modules. And this does give rise to the theory of coherent sheaves, which is a beautiful and extremely useful theory. It's one of the main tools you have in analytic geometry, but it's still constrained by the, the finiteness hypotheses that come into it. So that, for example, if you have a map of analytic spaces, you can't consider like the push forward of the structure sheaf as a coherent sheaf. But that should be, one, that's one of the main examples of quasi-coherent sheaves you like to play with in algebraic geometry, I mean, unless the map is finite or something. Um, so the theory of coherent sheaves is really nice and it works well in analytic geometry in basically all of these contexts, but it's still not as general and flexible as we're used to from algebraic geometry with quasi-coherent sheaves which have no inherent finiteness conditions. Um, so, so these are all kind of, you could say, theoretical reasons why we might want a new theory. Um, but there's also potentially a, a practical reason. So this is, is much more speculative. Um, so coming from the Langlands program. So, uh, Farg, Farg and Schulze, uh, they famously geometrized uh, local Langlands. And that led to kind of a clarification of, of the local Langlands program. And what was this geometric, geometrization based on? It was based on replacing QP uh, by some more exotic object. Uh, farg fontaine curve, or really you have to let the curve vary in families in some sense. So you could say farg fontaine curves. Uh, uh. And this was produced in the language of attic spaces, so it was attic space over QP, not at all of finite type. Uh, so uh, quite uh, a somewhat exotic beast, which thankfully this theory of attic spaces existed to accommodate it. Um, and um, again, quite speculatively, one might hope that uh, not just the local uh, Langlands program, but the global Langlands program can also be geometrized. Um, Very. Okay, Peter's always very optimistic, but I'm always very uh, of global Langlands. But this would involve replacing, say, Q or Z by some family of exotic analytic spaces. Um, and whatever, whatever such a thing is, it's going to have to have both Archimedean and non-Archimedean aspects. For example, you, there should also be a version over the real numbers, which I believe Peter is, is working out. Um, and it also is not going to be finite type in any sense. So there is simply no existing theory which could possibly give the language to describe such an object, if such an object even exists. Yeah, but <laughs> it's good to have a a theory, a precise theory to, to guide exploration of, of, of the possibility of such exotic things. Um, so that's a, another motivation. Um, so that is the end of my um, motivation section. Uh, so now's a good time for questions if people have them.
So you are going to introduce this Petrovich space I mean, Mercury's theory, what would it be? Or more general theory which encompasses all of this. Yeah, I'm going to we're, we're going to introduce a new theory and explain the relation to the previous theories. The previous. Yeah. Yeah, so that yeah, that's good to say. Yeah. So our our goal is in this course is to introduce a new theory of analytic geometry and to explain the relation with the previous theories. Yeah. So you will have not only the basic analytic rings but also some analytic spaces, analytic stuff. Well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But today I'm only going to give an introduction to the affinoid situations, kind of analytic rings, because it'll already be enough. Uh, already be enough there. Yes. Why is the theory of Huber spaces insufficient? Oh, it doesn't have any Archimedean. It, it doesn't. There are no. Ar it's it's non-Archimedean by design. Yeah. Yeah. Also, also some. So I I remember. Uh, I forgot now how it was called. Uh, uh, some kind of spectrum that it combines and I forgot the name of this, someone considered it, but it didn't develop it so much. Uh -huh. Yeah, there, there could be other theories than the ones I listed. I just listed the ones that I knew were well studied and, yeah. Okay, so then let me move on. Uh, so continuing the introduction. Um, Actually, I had a question. Yes, please. So, um, in the previous uh, sort of theories, yeah, like, uh, I think like in the Berkowitz setting, there were like rich uh, theories of cohomology, like the cohomology and stuff. There were variants of that. Yeah, but I mean, um, yeah, sure. The Berkowitz deeply studied a tall cohomology in, in, in the setting of Berkowitz spaces. Yeah. Okay. And um, okay, maybe I'll ask. Um, so the next section is called condensed math. So the, I mean the condensed math. Condensed math. Yes. Uh, so the the first this this issue here, the issue with descent, um, it can be attributed to the fact that these on all these different theories, these local rings that you have describing the local models, they're not just abstract rings; they're topological rings, and for many purposes, for example, uh, for Uh, well, so yeah, so the local models classically are, in fact, topological rings. And it's important to remember the topology. So, for example, okay, in algebraic geometry, uh, the uh, polynomial ring in two variables, which is functions on affine two spaces, the tensor product of polynomial ring in one variable and polynomial ring in one variable. Okay, but in say rigid analytic geometry, if you take the Tate algebra in dimension one and tensor it with the Tate algebra in dimension one again, you're going to get some crazy thing because you took an algebraic tensor product and you forgot the piadic topology. But if you do a, a piadically complete tensor product, you get the ring of functions, the correct geometric ring of functions, the two variable case. So you need to, in performing constructions such as tensor products, which are basically calculating fiber products geometrically, you need to remember the topology. That much is clear. Um, so. And that's at the basis for the reason why you don't have a naive theory of quasi-coherent sheaves and you have naive problems with gluing outside the finite type case. I mean, finitely generated uh, case. But topological rings uh, uh, and topological modules over them, which would be the kind of natural thing to do if you're thinking about quasi-coherent sheaves, are not suitable uh, for a general theory. And the basic reason, there's, there's many ways of saying it, but the basic reason is that, uh, you know, if you form this category, it's, it's not going to be abelian. 
the category of topological modules over a topological ring. And you can dress it up however you like. You can make it much more specific or whatever. It's just not going to be abelian. And the phenomenon is that if you have a dense inclusion of modules, which happens all the time when you have infinite dimensional things, uh, then it's going to be both an epimorphism and a monomorphism, uh, generally speaking, uh, in your reasonable categories. But it's not going to be an isomorphism. So. Separated. Yeah, yeah, I would have to say separated to make that literally a true claim. So, um, but otherwise, you can have you have a non strict map, and the image is two topologies, and this is not. Yeah, there, uh, we are not well defined image. Yes, 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 yes. Um, right. So, uh, so what we do is we kind of go very back to the start. Um, so we uh, go back to basics. And define a replacement for the category of topological spaces. And we do that in such a way that it's then very easy to pile algebraic structure on top of those things and talk about the analogs of topological rings and topological modules over them, and that such that we will get an abelian category. Uh, in the end. Um, and the basic idea is one that is very old, and I'm not sure, so s certainly it was, uh, certainly you know, Grotendieck uh, used this idea many times, and I don't, but I don't, I think it might even be older then go and you got a topological space is kind of funny because you have second order data, you have a set of points and then you have a set of subsets of that. And that's fundamentally what makes it difficult to mix with uh, algebraic structures. So instead you'd want to stick with kind of first order data, just points. And the, uh, the basic idea is you single out uh, a collection uh, of nice, let's say, test spaces. Uh, S, and then instead of uh, encoding a topological space X as traditionally, so a set and some set of open subsets, um, we just record the data uh, of what should be continuous maps. Uh, from your test space to that topological space and kind of axiomatize the structure and properties you see in that situation. So we were only, we're, we we're going to choose a nice collection of test spaces and then we're going to say we only, we only care about a topological space insofar as uh, the phenomena are seen by maps in from these nice test objects. Um, so, so you still have X ideas set. I put quotation marks around this. So, so uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll become a little more formal in a second, and then you can ask your question. Yeah. No, but traditionally, like they wanted to do homotopy theory with, then, so one way was to have X as a set and to fix a collection of notional compact of spaces to X. So yes. some people somehow work with this kind. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Substitute the <coughs> usual ones you can define homotopy and homology and do something. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe Spanier is a person and, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, formally, uh, so formally, uh, our test spaces. Uh, will be profinite sets, so-called profinite sets, uh, which is the same thing as uh, totally disconnected uh, compact house door spaces. Um, it's also just the same thing as inverse limits of finite sets, where the finite sets have a discrete topology and the inverse limit has the inverse limit topology. Um, 
And so this is what we, we uh, used in a previous iteration of this kind of course. Um, so the first course Peter taught on condensed math was uh, with this class of test spaces. But it does cause some troubles because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a large category. So there's no, if there's no cardinal bound on the profinite sets, then when you encode all of this data, you're encoding more than a set's worth of data. And it, it does cause some technical troubles. We more or less worked around them. but. So we're actually going to take a, a slight variant of this for the purposes of this course. Um, and we'll explain in more detail in the first few lectures, I think, um, why we make this precise choice. But so, so a, a, we'll say a light profinite set uh, is a, a countable inverse limit. of finite sets. It's also the same thing as requiring it to be metrizable. Um, and then, so uh, uh, a light condensed set uh, is a sheaf of sets on the category of light uh, profinite sets uh, with respect to the Grotendieck topology uh, and now I'll explain the Grotendieck topology covers our finite collections uh, uh, of jointly surjective maps, continuous maps. Yeah. Um, so finite disjoint unions are covers, and a surjection gives a cover. So this is like the perfect topology because you could add you can have also okay, a covering sieve is one which contains a finite collection of jointly surjective maps. Okay. Um, so, okay, this is we're using the language of Grotendieck topologies here uh, to be sure, and possibly not everyone is familiar with uh, the language of Grotendieck topologies and kind of the general how you play with categories of sheaves and so on. Let me make it more explicit. Uh, so, more explicitly. Uh, a light condensed set is a functor. Okay, th I'm not going to avoid the language of categories and functors. Uh, so light profinite set up to the category of sets uh, such that, so the first thing is that, well, x of empty set equals point. Second thing is that x of a disjoint union of two things is the product. Uh, and the third thing is that if you have a surjection t to s, then uh, xs is the equalizer of uh, xt, and then the two different pullback maps you have to the fiber product. Um, and, and the example, example is any topological space x gives a condensed set where the functor of points is just given by the continuous maps from s to x. So it's easy to see, well, the, the functoriality is just that you, if you have a map from t to s and a map from s to x, you get a map from t to x. And it's easy to verify all of these properties uh, for continuous maps out to an arbitrary topological space. So Grotendieck topology. I mean, you can just unwind it to this, but um, actually, 
it's kind of a, a bit of a bit illusory the elementary nature of this definition because um, we a, we are going to fairly seriously make use of the theory of Grotendieck topologies and sheaves in this course. It's it's just not worth it to avoid that theory, especially since it comes up both here in the definition of light condensed set and also later in the way in which you glue, glue uh, the affine case of analytic spaces to general analytic spaces. Um, it's not going to be, <laughs> we're just going to use the theory. So if you're not familiar with the theory of Grotendieck topologies and sheaves, I suggest, and you want to follow this course, I suggest you read up on it. Um, okay. Yes. Bother you make a trivial question. Yes. So what is the morphism between two, uh, two uh, profinite sets? Like yeah, so it's just a continuous map, or you have to right. require some filtration. I mean, it's just a continuous map, but it's also a, a map of pro systems. If you're thinking of it as a countable inverse limit, it's equivalent. It's yeah, yeah, it's the same same thing. Yes. Uh, do we know what are the points in the category of light condensed sets? Points in the ca ah oh oh in the topos theoretic sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, debatable. So, <laughs> we we'll discuss more such things in the in, in the coming lectures. Um, we know this invariance of topological space in QCLC, is that skillfully based for? No, not, not for general topological spaces, but for a large class of topological spaces it is. Yeah. Um, s right, so, so some, there's one thing that's clear, right? I started with a general idea, oh, you take some collection of test spaces and then you, okay, then you say what, you axiomatize the properties of maps from test spaces to a given topological space and you arrive at this axiomatics. But okay, it's actually not so simple because there's many possible choices of test spaces and beyond that, there's many possible choices of which <laughs> properties you want to put in your act, which properties you see mapping out from those test spaces to X that you put in the axioms uh, for your general objects, light condensed sets. Actually, there are other properties satisfied by X of S when X is a topological space that I didn't put in the axiomatics. Um, so there's kind of a little bit of a delicate balance here, and we will discuss more about how we arrived at precisely this, this choice, both of the test category of light profinite sets and this, for now I just want to make a couple of remarks which will maybe give a, a sense for why we make this precise definition. So, so first of all, uh, two, the, maybe the two most important examples of light profinite sets are <coughs> the point. <coughs> Uh, and then there's this, uh, the one-point compactification of the natural numbers. Um, and with this, you kind of get the underlying set. So if you take X of S, then you think of that as the underlying set of your condensed set. And with this, you get kind of a notion of uh, convergent sequences. Uh, in your condensed set, you get a set of conver set of convergent sequences. Again, it's abstract, so it's not literally. Well, in the case of a topological space, it literally is the set of convergent sequences. <coughs> so, also those things were considered in this volatile topology of pattern. I mean. Oh yes, yes, yes. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. They, but they had this. Uh, they use these projective things, projective yes. covers, which are yes. not light. That's correct. So this will be discussed. This will be discussed in, in in due time. Yeah. So, but yeah. So yeah, it's true. Bott and Schulze had this definition, but that doesn't mean that it was necessarily the correct thing to do for the purposes I'm about to discuss. But yeah, it turned out it was. Um, okay. And then, but then. Um, uh, so then, an, another remark is that allowing all surjections. Uh, to count as covers gives a nice uh, simplification of the structure of the category. And in particular, it gives some good homological algebra properties when you pass to 
light condensed abelian groups. Um, this, you have a lot of flexibility of working locally when you allow arbitrary surjections to count as covers. But on the other hand, uh, restricting the topology or requiring uh, the topology, the Grotendieck topology, to be finitary uh, gives good categorical compactness properties. Uh, for light profinite sets, uh, sitting by the Oneida netting inside all uh, uh, light condensed sets, and and moreover, and even and even for uh, all uh, metrizable compact Hausdorff spaces. So, for example. Uh, the unit interval famously is a, has a surjection from the Cantor set given by decimal expansions. Uh, and this is a light profinite set. And the fact that you have a finitary Grotendieck topology, and on the other hand, this, this guy is covered by this guy, which is one of the basic test objects, it, it means that the compactness of these compact house door spaces, which kind of we know from general topology, actually translates into a nice categorical compactness property inside this larger category. Um, and for this, it's actually important to have uh, these larger light profinite sets than just the sets of convergent sequences. OK. Um, let's see. OK, questions? No, no, that's not countable. I mean, it, you you could ask the collection of Klopin subsets to be countable. Yeah. So is the same thing saying set from the top of the topology? Yeah. Countable or neighborhood based? Yeah. Or, yeah, something like that. Or is it, it's the same as metrizable for sure. So yeah. Uh, no, they just every point is a countable neighborhood basis is weaker than the second, yeah. second countable. I mean, yeah, there are some way to. Yeah, you, yeah, you need a, you need a countable basis for the topology in total. Yeah. So anyway, okay, yeah. So it, it is the same thing as the uh, uh, opposite category of the countable Boolean algebra. Yes, I guess. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, yeah, the, it's, that, it's the same thing that the set of Klopin subsets is is countable. Yeah. Okay, further questions? Um, so I remind you that this is, this is just an introduction. We will go into much more detail in the, in the coming lectures. Okay, so, so what do we have now? We have, uh, oh, maybe I give myself a blackboard. Um, so what do you have so far? When now I've explained the light profinite sets, and so um, we're going to move on to analytic rings. And I'll start with a point, which is that these. Okay, from now on, <laughs> sorry. So I'm going to drop the light. Okay, so just so I don't have to write it and say it all the time. From now on, condensed set means light condensed set, and profinite set means light profinite set. I always have this countable uh, hypothesis floating around. Um, so condensed sets uh, gives rise to the notion of condensed ring and condensed module over a condensed ring. And it's really, uh, if you're familiar with the Grotendieck topologies and so on, it's completely immediate. So <coughs> it's just a sheaf of rings and then a sheaf of module over that sheaf of rings on this, uh, on this site here. It's also just a ring object in this category and a module object over the ring, that ring object in this category. Yeah? The question is to write a little bit bigger. Oh, a question to write a little bit bigger. <laughs> that sounds like more of a comment <laughs> or a request. OK. Uh, I will do my best. And please hassle me again if I don't live up to it. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, they didn't ask me to write more clearly. <laughs> well, anyway. Sorry? The formula is more clearly. Thanks. Yeah. OK. Um, and that's all well and good. And you might think naively, OK, so now we have, a, we have this uh, uh, category of condensed rings, for example. Why can't we just use that as our uh, local models for our analytic geometry? Kind of by analogy with schemes, where schemes are based on discrete. Oh, by the way, ring means commutative ring. Um, Schemes, you start with discrete rings, and then you figure out a way to glue them, and then you get schemes. Um, but it's not enough just condensed rings to get a good theory of analytic geometry. But, uh, no, please. So condensed ring is the same object where set is replaced by a ring. Yes. That's all. That's correct. So uh, but yeah. there's no additional structure on the ring. It's just a abstract ring. Right, when but you say condensed ring. It's just an abstract ring with those properties. No, no, what, no, no, no. It's a collection of abstract rings, one yes. for each S. Correct, correct. Yeah, 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 okay. That's right. Yeah. But, but it, it should satisfy all those properties. And XS cross XT, what does it become? The tensor product of the rings? No, the Cartesian product oh, of the Cartesian rings. Product. Yes. Yes. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, but where was I? Ah, but <coughs> are not enough uh, to give a good geometry. And the basic reason is as follows. So maybe I should say condensed rings alone. <coughs> so the, the category of condensed rings has uh, push-outs uh, given by relative tensor products, uh, just like in classical, just like in with classical commutative rings. Um, and those relative tensor products are what, geometrically speaking, should be calculating fiber products for you. Um, and they're the things that I sa said should correspond to completed tensor products, right? Um, but if you have uh, condensed rings uh, a, a and B over a condensed ring K, and you form this relative tensor product in this category, you can ask, well, what is the underlying ring of this? And it turns out, it's not actually hard to see from the nature of the Grotendieck topology, that this is uh, the same as the abstract tensor product of the underlying rings of all the individual things. So this condensed ring here is just, give, just gives a condensed structure. I mean on the point. Not just on the, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just gives a, a well, a non-trivial to be sure, but a, just gives a condensed structure on the, on the abstract tensor product. So it's not, in, in particular, it's not giving a completed tensor product. The completion procedure does change the underlying set, right? So this is not, not yet doing the correct thing. Uh, okay. So, to fix this, Uh, we put additional structure on a condensed ring. Um, so we record some class of modules, I mean condensed modules, uh, which are to be considered as complete. in some sense, complete. So the basic, um, yeah, and that will, uh, oh, I forgot to write larger. Oh, that will give the notion of analytic ring. <coughs> so an analytic ring will be a condensed ring together with some extra structure, which will tell you which of the, which of the condensed modules over that condensed ring you should consider as complete 
with respect to the theory that's being described by the analytic ring. Um, but before I make the definition more precise, uh, I have to scare more people away. I already said you should know Grotendieck topologies. Get ready. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I kind of I have to say more precisely what I mean by a ring. So, but I, I'm going to scare you. But then I'm going to say why you shouldn't be too scared. Uh, So why is this why is this a question? I just I already told you ring means commutative ring, right? But um, you didn't say commutative. No, I, I did. Oh. You, you need to pay better attention. So what kind of ring? Um, okay, so experience in algebraic geometry shows that the generally correct notion of a fiber product of schemes is actually the derived fiber product, which on the affine level corresponds to derived relative tensor product of rings. Now, the reason more people don't do it that way is because uh, it, it's a technical hassle to talk about these things, these derived uh, tensor products and derived rings and so on. But actually, that, that's not true anymore. We have Jacob Lurie's works. It's not a technical hassle anymore. You just have to you just have to do it, and it's, it's no problem. So we're, we're going to do it because it's the the correct uh, so it gives you the correct relative tensor products with giving a good theory in general. Now, that being said, basically all of the basic examples that we discuss, almost all of the basic examples that come up, will not have any derived structure. They'll just be ordinary rings. So you can comfortably follow the course even if you're not very familiar with derived rings. But you should bear in mind that for, for, you know, for, the, for the general claims that we're making, it won't necessarily be true if you imagine everything to be an ordinary ring, although in examples, many things will indeed be ordinary rings. Um, but now we go down a rabbit hole, because <laughs> once you decide to work with some notion of derived rings, there's actually several inequivalent choices of what you could mean by that. Um, so, so should be derived. Uh, but which kind? There's there's two basic options, and that's kind of uh, infinity algebras, and what some people call uh, animated commutative rings. I'm one of those people, uh, <laughs> which are the things that are presented by simplicial commutative rings. And, and then there's also the choice of whether you want it to uh, want to allow negative homotopy in both cases. Um, we won't allow negative homotopy. And we're going to, for the purposes of this course, we'll choose this one here. It's more uh, directly tied to classical algebraic geometry. Uh, when you start with ordinary schemes and you take derived tensor products, it's th the things you get always have this extra structure. So it makes sense to, to remember that and not think about these more general things. But actually, the, the whole theory that we're developing works perfectly fine in, in any of the different variants. And in fact, it's even less technical to set up in this seemingly more complicated uh, setting here, for reasons which I think we'll get into. Um, but so here, in the, the algebra is in the sense of spectra or over? Exactly. There's also that choice, yeah? You could, uh, do you mean infinity algebra is over z or over the sphere spectrum? Yeah. So, okay, so formally then, so just to get it on the, so formally, uh, uh, light animated ring, oh, sorry, condensed animated ring is a hypersheaf. Uh, of animated rings on the uh, site of light profinite sets. But again, I'm not saying light. Uh, um, 
OK. And now I'm going to make another uh, convention uh, that I'm probably just going to say ring when I mean animated ring. And if I want to stress that it actually just lives in degree 0, I'll say uh, classical, maybe, or static. Um, static being kind of the opposite of animated. Um, right, and that, that should help also help those of you who are not familiar with the theory to just pretend that everything is an ordinary ring, because that's, that's pretty much OK. Um, all right. Um, and the, the basic invariant for us of such a condensed animated ring is its derived category. So the, uh, oh, I need to write bigger. Of such, uh, such an R is its full derived category. Uh, uh. So this is defining Dobby in some in Yeah, so you, you, yeah, you look at just at hyper sheaves of modules over this, you know, up, up unbounded modules so over this sheaf of rings R. Yeah. No, just uh, also, just a sec. Do it with simplicial and cosimplicial, or does it do it? I don't know. Uh, uh, cosimplicial? No, no. If you want to, you have simplicial modules of a simplicial ring. Yeah. Is it not enough to have unbounded in all the, in the. No, yeah, you don't. I mean, yeah, you don't really set it up like that. You don't talk about simplicial modules over a simplicial ring, because then that would be the connective part. I mean, you could do that and then just say you kind of formally add in the, the negative things by, by filtered co limits or something. I mean, by, by, yeah. Do you do it by... I mean, the way he does it is he forgets the infinity algebras, and then that's just a commutative algebra object in D of Z, and then that has a natural notion of module in the infinity category theory. So, so I mean, the, the, the theory of modules factors over the underlying e infinity algebra, and you, oh, okay. that, that's just... And this is in, in which, in the... In that, in the Hi higher algebra, maybe, or or SAG, probably discussed in more detail, spectral algebraic geometry. So, but there is no. Uh... I'm going to say something to help orient. Uh, yeah. So, if R is static, so again, that means it's just an ordinary <laughs> condensed ring. Uh, then this is the, the usual or the infinity category enhancement of the usual uh, unbounded derived category. Uh, of the abelian category of condensed R modules. Again, in the, in the totally naive sense of you have a sheaf of rings and you take a sheaf of modules over that sheaf of rings. Yes? Can I ask you to comment on specifically why you want hypersheaves everywhere? It's because we want things like convergence of Posnikov tower. And we know we can prove that in the world of hypersheaves, but we can't prove that in the world of sheaves. So we don't know that sheaves and hypersheaves are the same thing. And also, we can always prove everything is a hypersheaf. And we can always, I mean, hypercovers never give us more trouble in practice than ordinary covers. So we're not losing anything by requiring that. Yes. I have a question in analogy like classical algebra. Geometry. Yes. Like can define schemes in general like just co-limits of representable sheaves. Uh -huh. What happens if we do the same here? Like if we take like we glue representable sheaves over condensed strings. No, with just condensed strings, you're never going to get a good theory. You need you need this extra structure. Yeah, but I mean, if you take sheaves over condensed strings, also. That's all. I mean, the same reason will hold, yeah? I mean, this will be, this will be your pullback in pre sheaves and it's just not the right thing. So, yeah. Uh, other questions? What? Oh, yes. Hi, Matthew. Yes. Hi. <laughs> it's not clear to me that a static animated ring. Is a condensed animated ring in a new sense? It seems like you need some vanishing of cohomology, because previously it was kind of 
chief condition in just the one categorical set? It works. I'm not going to get into it right now. We'll talk after. Yeah, yeah. This is not the time for such a technical question. Apologies. But, it, but don't worry if it's correct. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Uh, okay, so now I can give the, the formal definition. Um, Uh, yes, yes. I don't want to say discrete because we also have this condensed stuff, and then you discrete could mean, yeah. So that's the reason for changing the terminology. Yeah. So what must you also? No, uh, over no, no. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so the definition is, so an analytic ring uh, is a pair R, uh, and then I'm going to use funny notation, uh, uh, where this triangle thing uh, is a condensed ring. And uh, the derived category of the analytic ring is supposed to be a full subcategory of the derived category of this condensed ring, which is sort of its envelope, um, is such that. And then we're going to demand some rather strong closure properties. Remember, the idea was this was supposed to be singling out a collection of complete modules. Um, and the first condition is that uh, this full subcategory uh, is closed under, so in inside this ambient category here, is closed under all uh, limits and co-limits. Uh, the second property is that if, let's say, n lies in here and m lies in here, uh, then kind of the internal r hom uh, from m to n still lies in the smaller thing. Um, the third condition uh, is kind of technical. So I said we, uh, we wanted our rings to be connective, so no negative homotopy. In some sense, we also want to require that our analytic rings be connective. And we say it like this. So if, uh, if uh, I'd say this uh, denotes the left adjoint to the inclusion, Um, so again, that's some kind of completion functor. Uh, then uh, this completion uh, sends uh, uh, the connective subcategory here to the connective subcategory again. So it preserves connective objects. I should have said, I'm sorry, I meant to remind over here. I <coughs> So I said, if R is static, this is the usual unbounded derived category of this abelian category. In particular, it has a T structure, has a notion of connective objects and anti-connective objects. But even in general, for a general R, you still have a T structure. Um, but it's not the derived category of its heart anymore uh, when, when your ring is not static. Say, uh, <coughs> which kind of T structure you have in, in uh, just uh, in terms of the vanishing of, of cohorts? Yeah, exactly. And you use homological notation. I, I always use homological notation, yes. Yes. Why do we need the connective objects? Uh, ah, why do we require this? There's some, some statements. Uh, for some statements, it's convenient to have a kind of reduction from a general uh, animated ring to the static case, namely it's pi zero. And for this kind of reduction, it's um, it's important to have this uh, kind of control on connectivity. So once you assume there are limits and co-limits, so yeah. this is under usual categories or infinity categories, the same uh, that is... Uh, 
well, if it's a triangulated subcategory closed under products and direct sums, yeah. then yeah. Then to have the R join, you need sometimes some set theoretical yeah. condition. Is it automatic? Yes. Here? Yes. So like the being generated by a set or? Yeah, it's automatic. It's automatic. Uh, quick, one question. Yes. Uh, with condensed ring, you mean condensed animated ring? Yeah, I, I made that convention maybe only in words, but yes, exactly. Uh huh. So from now on, a ring is a static ring, and an animated ring is a ring. Um, okay. Uh, Ofer, let's ha let another one have a chance first. Uh, yes. It's the analog of the A plus inside that. Indeed, it is. Indeed, it is. Yes. Uh, Ofer. No, oh, just to make sure. So, it's one and two implies that the left adjoint exists. Right. Okay. Um, Ah, right, I forgot to say what a map is. So, a map of analytic rings. Sorry, I, 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 I missed the here what you said. So, the condensed ring is uh, animated or always. Yes, it's animated. Animated, okay. Yeah. Uh, it is just a map of condensed rings. such that, so it's just a condition, uh, if m lies in d of s, uh, then the restriction of scalars of m uh, should lie in d of r. So, so uh, along r to s. Yeah, I, I wrote it a little funny, but I hope, I hope the meaning is clear. So if you have an object in D of S triangle, uh, which happens to lie in D of S, then when you restrict it to an R, triang R triangle module, it should, it should lie in D of R. Um, OK. So I'll make some remarks. So. Uh, there's always a t-structure on D of R. And in fact, that's quite naive. So the connective part is just uh, the intersection of the connective part for the enveloping ring. Um, and same with the anti-connective part. So you can check everything in this potentially more familiar category here. So it's actually z-graded, not just positively graded. The modules are z-graded, yes. The ring is positively graded. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But the modules you are allowed to be z-graded. Indeed. Indeed. Um, and in particular, you get an abelian category. So d of r, the heart of the t structure, which again is just a d of r uh, intersect uh, this. Um, And actually, this abelian category also determines the, the analytic ring structure. So I can also, so I can also say that uh, D of R is giving an analytic ring structure on R triangle. And um, there's actually an equivalent axiomatics uh, just at the abelian level. So I could instead say that I give a, 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 a condensed ring and an abelian subcategory of you know, the, the heart of D of R or a D of R triangle, satisfying certain axioms. Yes? Sorry, um, just maybe kind of slow it down. But, yeah. but for the definition of an analytic ring, yeah. I'm just trying to like understand why, or like, uh, why, in what sense is it analytic? Like, like why? Yeah, so that's something I can't answer right now. But it'll come when, I, when we discuss examples. Uh, and so the, but the motivation was the simple thing I said, that we want relative tensor products to be completed. And OK. Uh, yes, Robert. Can I drop part triangle if I want and just remember the category as a... Oh, I forgot an axiom. Sorry, you just reminded me. Uh -huh. the, because the answer to your question is no because of this axiom. <laughs> um, 
Sorry, I forgot to require that the, the unit should be complete, so. Yeah. Uh, the ring itself should be complete. Then why can't I drop the top R triangle entirely? Well, you, yeah, and then you, you need some extra structure on D of R. I remember it as yeah. a condensed category? Yeah. Yeah, that's still not enough because I'm doing the animated context and not the infinity context. What if I remember the said addition? <laughs> yeah, then that's enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so that's another perspective is you were just giving an abelian category of complete modules. There's also a third perspective which is useful. So, so to, to understand what an analytic ring structure is, this is very abstract and it's talking about big categories and stuff, but um, but for a light profinite set, oh, I, wasn't, I said I wasn't going to say light. Uh, as we can consider the free, S, the free module. So it's denoted R bracket S. And what is it? By definition, um, you take the free module over the condensed ring, uh, and then you just complete it. So put it in the there via the left adjoint. Um, and these generate uh, d of r greater than or equal to 0 under co-limits. So those are kind of your basic, basic building blocks, your basic generating objects. And again, there's another equivalent axiomatics, um, which takes as the second data in the pair, not the category, full subcategory dr, but just the collection of free modules on profinite sets, objects in d of r triangle. Um, so <coughs> to gain intuition about what this thing can kind of look like, um, it's useful to think. Uh, so this is not in the heart in general? In general, it's not in the heart. In basically all examples, it is. But in the general theory, it's not. Um, <coughs> so, so think, so intuition, uh, so this R triangle bracket S is kind of, well, it's just R linear combinations of points in S, kind of completely intuitively, finite R linear combinations of points in S, but you can think of it as space of uh, uh, R linear combinations uh, of Dirac measures. Hey, Robert, I did something for you. <laughs> uh, and then, then this RS is some completion. So that's a, a bigger space of measures. So uh, again, an analytic ring structure can also be thought in terms of as specifying some space of measures. Uh, on a on a profinite set, and what is the role of this space of measures? Um, so the role. So an M, let's say in the heart for simplicity, uh, lies in in D R heart uh, if and only if for all maps F from our triangle S uh, to M of our triangle modules, uh, there exists a unique extension uh, along uh, R bracket S. Um, or in other words, uh, if F is kind of a function from your profinite set to your module, uh, which is some kind of some kind of linear algebra object with a topology, say, um, and uh, mu is one of these kinds of measures that you're allowing, then we get a well-defined. Uh, you could call it the integral of this function along. The, uh, sorry, <laughs> the integral over S of the function. Uh, I don't know d mu or wh whatever you want. You can pair them to get a. You can pair the function and the measure to get uh, a value in the target module. 
So this is uh, explaining some sense in which uh, this, is, uh, this behaves like a completeness condition. It's complete enough that you can do non-trivial integrals uh, against certain classes of measures, which you specify as part of the data, you could say. Yes? Did you give up all the full subcategory? Yes. And is it compact with you? No. Uh, even, the d even this one isn't? They're all presentable, but not Yeah. And that's because we did this light restriction. Uh, yeah. So we'll have to get into that. Uh, yes? How does the light restriction, is it omega-1 compactly generated? It is, it is omega-1 compactly generated, yes. Is it dualizable? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Yes? Uh, well, I wasn't claiming there exists a unique extension. I was claiming this condition is equivalent to this condition. So were you saying, wh why, if this lies here, does there exist this unique extension? Yeah, so that's because, b basically just by left adjointness. Um, but it, it comes from unraveling the definitions. Yeah. What is, uh, the question was, which one is, is only the one compactly generated, the, the, the big one or the small one? Neither. Oh, no, both of them. Sorry, both. Both. I, I, I misheard the omega one. Yeah. Uh, both are. Ah, both. Yes. Okay. So, it, I don't think I'm going to have time to get to examples, which is rather unfortunate, but uh, I don't know. Maybe Peter will... I don't know. We'll see what Peter plans for Friday. It'd be nice to talk about some examples. <laughs> um, uh, but instead, I, I think I'll probably finish, well, yeah, I'll probably finish with a discussion of um, co-limits in the category of analytic rings. And in particular, I want to talk about push-outs, because this is the crucial thing, which is supposed to give completed tensor products, which correspond to geometrically good fiber products. So where am I? Uh, here. So you don't use animated structure on analytic rings? Sorry? Animatic structure of analytical means some compatibility with uh, reliable. Oh, yeah, so one of the things we prove is that it comes for free. Ah, okay. Yeah. I mean, you have to, I mean, this is a, I mean, no, make no mistake, in the maps you have a map of, you have a map of animated rings from the R triangle to S triangle. But then it turns out whatever the linear algebra operations you might expect to, like symmetric powers and so on, will sort of automatically go through. Yeah. yeah, it's not obvious by any means. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in your definition of morphism, you have just a pullback to respect to your body. Yes. You can protect the left adjoint to that, because yes. everything is presentable. Like. Yeah, that's right. That, so that, that's, the, that's the most important functor, is the, the left adjoint to the thing that was in the definition. That's a, that's a very good point. That's, yeah. So there's some things I'm not mentioning, like that uh, D of R is actually symmetric monoidal, and this completion functor is a symmetric monoidal functor, and these pullbacks, the left adjoints we were talking about, are symmetric monoidal. So these are the things that... Um, and they preserve the subcategory of part? Well, by definition, it's defined to be the left adjoint to this restricted functor. Yeah. Or you take the... But, but it is not true that if you do the left adjoint on the level of the, these envelopes, that it necessarily preserves the category. You have to complete at the end. So again, it's kind of a completed tensor product in this base change here. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so co-limits in analytic rings. Um, so, uh, so, it, so, it's, um, filtered co-limits, or more generally, sifted co-limits, I'm sorry? Oh, the usual notion, so based on finiteness. I mean, uh, yes. Oh, uh, Aleph not filtered, yeah. I thought it might be important because you have all yeah. this I mean, indeed, one could imagine it might be important. But when I say this, then there's no discrepancy. So it's a, I mean, there's no ambiguity. So, um, so if you have filtered co-limit of Ri, uh, then the underlying uh, animated ring is just the filtered co-limit of the underlying things. 
Um, and also the free modules are, are similarly described. It's just the filtered co-limit of the, the free modules on the SNS. Um, so that's rather, rather naive. Um, and what's kind of left is push-outs. And this is more interesting. So push-outs. So if, if again, we have maps of analytic rings. I'll call them k, a, and b. Um, I'll write the push-out as a relative tensor product, just because. Um, then the derived category of the push-out can be more or less immediately described. So I'm not talking about the first point in the data, but just the second point. Um, uh, so abstractly, this category will be the same thing. It will, will actually be a full subcategory of uh, you take the push-out in uh, animated, sorry, in, in condensed rings, uh, and then it's the full subcategory such that the underlying uh, a triangle module lies in in D A and the underlying uh, B triangle module lies in D B. Um, but, but this, uh, but, caution, uh, so A triangle tensor K triangle B triangle uh, D A tensor K B is not an analytic ring. So it, it satisfies uh, one through three, but not four. So it's almost an analytic ring. The only thing is that the unit object, the, the, the underlying ring, is not complete. But then you fix that by applying a completion procedure. To fix this, uh, apply. You can still prove there's a left adjoint. Uh, uh, to d a tensor k b sitting inside d a triangle tensor k triangle b triangle. So I think you're using D in two, two ways here, not just simple D. I mean, okay. you're the right category of, of A tensor D as a ring in this when you're writing it here. Because it's also, it's also part of the definition of an analytic ring. That's true. That's true. So let me make a remark uh, to, to reconcile this. That uh, there's a trivial example of an analytic ring structure on any condensed ring, which is that you take D of A to be equal to all of D of A triangle. And with this interpretation, the notations are completely consistent. So you could call that analytic ring, you could call that analytic ring A triangle. It's just the, um, so every condensed ring can be viewed as an analytic ring with kind of trivial analytic ring structure or maximal analytic ring structure. Everything is complete. And with that in mind, then there's actually no conflict in the notation. This is different, there's a different thing you could have done here, which is take, uh, so you have A as an analytic ring. Yeah. So it has a subcategory dA, which yeah. is part of the data. Yeah. And you could take dA tensor dB as the tensible category, so yeah. you dK. Yeah. And that would be a different oh. thing than doing this. Oh, no, actually, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same? Yeah. So, um, OK. Uh, what next? Um, oh, question. Oh, I'm going to call on the person who raised his hand first. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, just the same as the tensor product of the categories? Oh, that was already asked oh. and answered. Yeah. Ofer? OK. Uh, is it, do you change the ring when you apply completion? You change, you yes. change the, the, of course, the simplicial ring is uh, derived. Anyway, you, you, you apply the completion in the category D. And then you must get another simplicial ring? Yes, we have to prove that. It's not obvious, but yes. 
So there's a so yeah. So then when you apply that completion procedure, the category stays the same, but then this becomes completed. And also, I, I should make a remark that in complete generality, it can be rather difficult to understand this completion process. You kind of have to iterate applying the completion for A and the completion for B, sandwiching them between each other, take a count do it countably many times, take a co-limit. Like, abstractly, that's the formula for this completion procedure here. Now, in practice, uh, it turns out you can calculate it. And this is one of the points. Uh, in practice, <laughs> I don't think I have time to discuss examples today, but this completion procedure, which replaces this by the true underlying ring of uh, the, the, the push-out in uh, analytic rings, it produces the geom geometrically correct completed tensor products in analytic geometry. Um, okay, so maybe... Um, There's a question from ah, the Zoom. Yes. Is the condition on the Frobenius still necessary, or did you show that it is always satisfied? It's always satisfied in this. That's one of the reasons for choosing this light condensed set framework. It's actually always satisfied. Phew. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so maybe, okay, maybe I'll start to talk about examples. So. I risk kind of getting cut off in the middle of an explanation, but I feel like it's just too dry without, well, I won't get very far. Okay, let's, do, let, let's try, let's try. Um, so I wanna talk about uh, maybe solid analytic rings. Um, and this will relate to uh, attic spaces or Huber pairs. Um, so uh, it's kind of going to be a non-Archimedean condition. So, so I mentioned that if you if you have an analytic ring, and we haven't talked about how to produce them yet, but if you have one, um, then it's nice to look at these free modules and profinite sets to get an idea about what what's going on? What, what spaces of measures do you, are you actually looking at here? And I also said that with the basic example of a profinite set, well, besides the point, was this n union infinity classifying convergent sequences. So, but um, in this linear case, it's, it's natural to consider the following. So given an analytic ring R, it's natural con to consider what you could call, I guess, space of measures on the natural numbers. And I don't mean the free module on this discrete thing, but what I mean is you take uh, the free module on this sequence space and then you mod out by infinity. So this, in some sense, classifies null sequences. Uh, in R modules. Oh, I have a blackboard up there, too. And it turns out it's not hard to show that um, addition on n induces a ring structure on, uh, on this mRn. Um, and as a ring, it kind of sits in between two rather extreme options. Uh, uh, so maybe, maybe you want to think of this as t to the n for the purposes of this kind of discussion. Um, so it's sitting somewhere in between the polynomial algebra and the power series algebra over your ring R. Um, as you could imagine for something like a space of null sequences, right? Uh, or sequences with some gross growth condition. I mean, it's really dual to null sequences. It's maybe some kind of summability condition. Um, so geometrically speaking, we have the affine line, and we have some version of the formal neighborhood of the origin, and then we have something that sits somewhere in between, right? Um, 
And now I'm going to single out a condition which is kind of a non-Archimedean condition that morally speaking will mean that this guy uh, lies inside the open unit disk of radius 1. Um, but formally, so let's say definition, uh, R is solid uh, if, um, if, you, if it just avoids the, 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 the point 1 on the affine line. And the way you express that is by saying that if you do this, you get 0. But since you quotient by the constant, R infinity is just the, the... Ah, okay, this is the home? Yeah, that's just R. And then, but, you know, and then it's mapping into R n union infinity by the inclusion of the point infinity. So R n union infinity is the free... Yeah. In this R, the free R module on this finite... Yes. Viewed as a, as a as a condensed object. No, okay, no, no. It's not condensed. It's Sorry, it's not solid in what what sense? Is that like solid over Z or? Uh, just a sec. I mean, this is the. I've, so far, I've just said this definition, right? So you, I mean, I'm in this sense, but just a second. Um. um okay. So uh, there's an interpretation of this, which is. Well, if you have this and it's actually equivalent, then you get a measure, so to, so to speak. Uh, so t minus 1 has to, you know, multiplication by t minus 1 has to kill. So if you have, any, if you have any, anything here, there has to be a pre-image under multiplication by t minus 1. So there, this means you get some measure here such that um, t minus 1 times mu is equal to the unit object in, in this ring, mrn which is kind of the sequence 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, and if you think about what this means, thinking about this uh, measure space sitting between polynomials and power series, this corresponds to kind of sum over n t to the n. Uh, that's it, at the very least what it maps to in the formal power series ring. Um, but on the other hand, this measure space, as I said, classifies null sequences. Um, and you know, so the, and this measure pairs with a null sequence. To, to if you have a null sequence in an R module M and a measure, I said you can pair the two things to get a function. And the way it works is you take your null sequence, you put it as coefficients here, um, and uh, yeah, you set t equal to one. Um, so what this, in the interpretation of this is that every null sequence, uh, you kind of have to work it out, but the interpretation is that every null sequence is summable. Um, uh, which is kind of classic uh, non-Archimedean condition. So solid is kind of one way of saying non-Archimedean in this context, but it's kind of fun that geometrically you can think of it as constraining the location of a, something between zero and the whole affine line. Um, and maybe I will state the theorem. Ah, yes? No? Okay. So theorem... So there's a question from yeah. the chat. Yeah. Is the multiplication closed in MRA? Multiplication closed. I mean, it's a ring. I don't know it. What? Uh, maybe I have some sort of similar question. Yeah. As you construct it, I guess it's constructed as some, some cone. It's not the best. Okay. Category. But at the moment, yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But in the universal case, Z with the trivial analytic ring structure, it lives in degree zero. There's no, I mean, and also, that's a sum end. It's really. Okay, it's, yeah. it's, still not, it's not in the half. It is. In the universal case, it is. Case yeah. And to produce a ring structure, I can work in the. It's a ring. It's yeah, in the universal case, it's a ring, and then by base change, it's a ring in whatever sense you want in whatever other context. Mm -hmm. I, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, theorem. Uh, so, there exists a solid analytic ring. Uh, so it's called Z solid, and well, it, the underlying condensed ring is just the usual integer Z, kind of discrete topology, and then, well, the derived category is something which I'll discuss in more detail, such that uh, an analytic ring uh, is solid uh, if and only if 
there exists a necessarily unique map uh, from Z solid to R. Um, and moreover, uh, you can actually understand this analytic ring very, very explicitly. So there's some nice results on linear algebra in this basic category. Um, so the first thing is that you, well, the first thing you want to ask is what are the free modules on profinite sets? So let's say S is some countable inverse limit of finite sets. Then this is just the inverse limit of uh, the free module on the finite set, which is just a finite direct sum of copies of Z. Um, and also, this is abstractly isomorphic to some countable product of copies of Z. Uh, countably infinite, unless, of course, S is itself a finite set. What does that say next to the, the there exists? Is that say unique? Uh, it says necessarily unique. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the second thing is that, oops. Um, uh, right. So these. Uh, so these, these are, remember I said that these guys always generate the category. So in this case, these products generate the category. But moreover, these guys here are compact and projective generators of the, well, let's say the, of the heart. Um, but they live in degree zero. So another thing you have is that the derived category here is just the derived, usual derived category of its heart. So it's enough to talk about the abelian category. Um, uh, and also, these are flat with respect to the tensor product, the completed tensor product, uh, which I kind of mentioned exists. Um, so here's another point where we use the lightness, because uh, Sasha Fimov uh, proved that this does not hold if you increase the cardinalities on the profinite sets. Um, and moreover, you can calculate tensor products rather easily. So the tensor product of this with this uh, over Z solid is just you have the infinite distributive law, so to speak. Um, that makes for very easy calculations. And uh, sorry, so I mean, uh, uh, just asking the cardinality to be the regular is not enough. It is uh, really mystery. Yeah, it's really countable. Really, yeah, yeah. Um, right. So the and the the collection of finitely presented objects in D of Z heart, uh, which is it generates it under filtered co-limits, um, is uh, abelian and closed under extensions. And every, every finitely presented M has a resolution, a free resolution, you could say, by product of copies of Zs uh, of length at most 2, meaning a complex where there's three non-trivial terms and two non-trivial maps. Uh, so this kind of gives you a very good hold on calculations in this category, very, very explicit. Um, so note that you can interpret this sort of as saying that uh, so Z solid <coughs> behaves like a regular ring uh, of dimension 2. Uh, so Z is a regular ring of dimension 1. We somehow picked up an extra dimension, and that can be attributed to the non-Hausdorff phenomena that you see in, uh, in solid abelian groups. Um, but in, in, in all things told, you get a very good handle on this category. So I think that's the, the only example I have time to discuss. And thank you for your attention.
as far as actually there is only no I is accountable, that means there is only one after the generator is horizontal. Right, there's a single generator. Actually, this is kind of a general phenomenon because the, the free module on the Cantor set will always, will always generate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes? When, when, when we are taking the push out, uh, there's a completion pointer. Yes. Which a priori gives you a derived category of this. Why yeah. is it that it's a ring? Yeah, that's something you have to prove, and it's not obvious. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Chat. You ask question if there will be lecture notes and video recordings. Video recordings, yes. Lecture notes, we're kind of trying to write a book at the same time as we give these lectures, and it's not clear to what extent we'll be releasing things sequentially or all at once at some point. So in terms of major application of this theory, is it possible to describe it in one, two sentences? Uh, 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 I mean, that would keep being motivated too. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. I don't know. Or do, uh, do you like Riemann Roch? Of course, I like Riemann Roch. Okay. Then you, it proves the most general uh, possible Riemann Roch theorems in analytic geometry. Yeah, so he crucially uses these derived categories and the fluidity of the formalism and so on. Yes? What's the notion of the uh, right hand triangle? Um, Peter told me Huber uses it. Uh, had to find something. Yes? Is there a technical advantage to using a light condensed set instead of the general condensed set? I mean, uh, for, the, like, for this uh, analytic. Yes. But it makes uh, the uh, uh, advantage, but the, for just the like, topology. Oh, for general topology? Well, I don't know. yeah. I mean, there are some mm, more subtle properties that tend only to hold. For general topology, maybe not. But if, if once you start ha talking about topological groups and so on, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I asked the same question, but backwards. Yes. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> I think I just strictly prefer the light setup. So the yeah. other one, yeah. the unboundedness. And yeah. Like, is there any case where I would actually want to go back to that one? Yeah. Well, it, it's it, at the very least, it's psychologically comforting when you have a strong limit cardinal that you get uh, like compactly generated derived categories and so on. Turns out it's not so important necessarily in practice, but it, it's kind of maybe quite important psychologically. But then, okay, that's just a larger cardinality bound. Why you would go all the way, it's just to avoid choosing a cardinality bound. And so you can say all compact house door spaces are profile, I mean, are condensed sets, but there's no real reason necessarily. Yeah. What is the structure if you use diffuse infinity algebras? Infinity algebras. What are those? What is the, <coughs> the structure? Can we compare? What's but I don't. I don't understand the question. Uh, I mean, uh, to a structure, can we use infinity algebras? But what is the? I don't know this term. Uh, infinite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, E infinity. Ah, okay. <laughs> ah. Uh, everything works the same, except it's a bit easier if you use E infinity algebras. <laughs> yeah, the people who are comfortable with E infinity algebras are not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> why, why not? Why not even better? Why not you want? I mean, what is the commutativity? Oh yeah, so you could you could do a version of this theory, of course, with e1 and e2. But but there's something very special about e infinity or animated commutative, which is that coproducts are the same as relative tensor products. That's very nice. And moving to realms where that's broken can be a real pain. Okay.
Okay. So that's it. Thank you.